All right, we're back. We have Dr. Stuart McGill and Mark Sertica is back as well. Stu, thank you so much for coming on. This is in regards to the podcast you had with Peter Atia, our recent episode kind of discussing the conversation you and, and Peter had. And we wanted to give you the platform to elaborate on things that may have been said, things you maybe want to elaborate on and just have kind of an open discussion. So thanks again, Stu. I'll let you start with kind of that caveat that you mentioned to me, and then we'll start with the first question. All right. Well, good morning, Chris, and uh, good morning, Mark. Uh, Thanks for this uh, opportunity, first of all. And and I did want to uh, say this uh, about uh, the Peter Atia and my uh, podcast. I hope people realize that that was totally unrehearsed. I had no idea what questions Peter was going to ask me. And you have 25 milliseconds to think of a logic after he hits you with the question. And I went home at night thinking, oh, I wish I could have every one of those questions back again with an hour to think of a good answer. And uh, I would have done a a much better job, as everybody does who who does these uh, podcast. So, you know, it, it is what it is. So this is the, the, the time to clarify a few things. And, and that's my objective today. Perfect. Let's start, Stu, with, and we would recommend people listen to that episode if they want to hear the, the initial conversation as opposed to just hearing this starting discussion. But Stu, within that episode, there was the the discussion around deadlifts in older adults. And when Mark and I recorded the most recent episode, we had our initial interpretation from what you had stated with Peter. And we're just going to provide what our interpretation was, and then we'll let you elaborate on that. If, if you agree with our interpretation, what your thoughts are. So what we took away from that episode with Peter was heavy deadlifts in older adults is inherently injurious it will lead to a greater likelihood of total hip procedures or total hip arthroplasties. And it's generally not recommended for this population. Yoga practitioners, people on the end of the spectrum that have flexible bendy spines, they all shouldn't, also shouldn't be deadlifting. That, that was kind of our interpretation. And then we discussed our kind of disagreement with some of those things, but we'll let you, we'll let you take it from there, Stu. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, I wish I had that question back again, (laughs) as I said. So my frame of mind at the time, not to make excuses because I said what I said, but uh, Peter had told his story about deadlifting, uh, very heavy, uh, terrible, devastating pain, and his wanting to set personal bests and that kind of thing. So my response that's where my brain was uh, for, for Peter in that. And I didn't expand the discussion to the general population, which was my misstep uh, uh, at, at, the, at the moment. So for the record, I'm not opposed to any kind of exercise. I don't love or hate deadlifts or uh, squats or, you know, we're sitting here in, in BackFit Pro HQ. You, we can go for a tour if you want. <laughs> we program all of those things. But in our world, everyone who comes here has back pain and every one of them uh, is different. They don't have nonspecific back pain. Every single one is different. So would I program deadlifts for every older person? And am I worried about osteoporosis? Of course I am. Um, I'll I'll get to the osteoporosis question uh, in just a minute. But let's go to the mechanism of osteogenesis. So... There are several, some are chemical, but they are induced by load. If we look at the piezoelectric uh, one, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but if I took a long bone and I bent it, uh, it is strain of the bone cells, the osteons, that create a piezoelectric charge, which suck in chemically, so to speak, uh, chemically attract free ions of calcium and magnesium, bind them on, and you create a bone callus. 
Um, when you look at the literature of that, my interpretation is, yes, it's load, but rate of load is probably more osteogenic. So when you look at the astronaut program with NASA, for example, they have astronauts doing bungee jumps in space, which are squat jumps. Um, and uh, is a slow deadlift uh, the best? And by the way, I'm very familiar with lift more from Australia and uh, all the rest of it. If I have to go back to an individual now, though, because you used the word older adults. Well, to me, every older adult is very different. Around here, I live in rural middle Ontario, and a lot of the old timers, older than myself, still chop their own firewood. I'm not worried about mineral loss in those very robust people. Uh, they deadlift heavy logs every day. <laughs> And those who say, well, I'm going to live with my son now, I don't have to split my firewood, you might be surprised that, yes, I will give them a fairly heavy resistance training program. So I hope that clears, uh, clarifies where I was coming from uh, at that time. On the other hand, here we are at BackFit Pro where we get clients who come in and people won't like this, but I'm going to say it. In my view, there's almost an epidemic of people hurting themselves with excessive deadlifts. Now, these are with trainers and physios, not like you, who are skilled in prescribing exercise with good technique, proper volume, proper rest periods, and all the rest of it. But the stories that I hear of them coming in, oh, I've been deadlifting uh, three months and the trainer had me lifting twice my body weight. And I said, okay, uh, do you have a video of, of any of this with terrible form and whatnot? And, and that was my concern and mindset when, when I'm worried about deadlifts was totally inappropriate for uh, that particular older person. The next person comes in, and I know you discussed the idea of me reorientating their goals. But what was on my mind at that time, and I thought I mentioned this, was a fella who came in and uh, had uh, end plate microfractures. It wasn't in the radiology report. I had to find it. The radiologist missed it. And he said, uh, can, I said, what's your goal? He says, well, I want my next personal best. And, I, and I, but it turns out he was an exercise addict. He fed off the need to go to the gym every day. If he continued with that addiction, I had no chance to get him better. So that was my, my mindset there. Of course, for the exercise addict, I have to reframe their goal. And that's when I said, how would you like to uh, play with your kids? And that's my mind frame at the time. The next person comes in and they're exercise adverse. They're pre-diabetic, or maybe even diabetic. In other words, they're a totally different clinical picture. Now, I have to reorientate their goals to having a better next 10 years, and it's going to involve resistance training. So that's an encouragement. So do you see one person, the addict, I have to hold back. The next person uh, needs encouragement. So that's where I get stuck. Um, I, I really have to treat all these people uh, as individuals. But, you know, Peter pulled me up on that. He said, we don't want to give everybody the impression that deadlifting and resistance training is dangerous. And then it hit me. Oh, damn, I've been emphasizing that too much in my story. Uh, and I, uh, at that point, said, yes, Peter, you're absolutely correct. And then he went on to the next thing. So to, to summarize, or, or for the record, uh, I'm an old man myself. I do deadlifts, <laughs> but not to the degree of the competitive deadlifters. You know, I've, I've worked with the American man who holds the uh, deadlift record for men over 75. Uh, it was a very special training program uh, to get that. Um, I am nowhere near in that category and I lift off blocks. So I'm very aware of all of the modifications. So anyway, does that help reframe that a little bit? Yeah, that does do. Yeah, we really appreciate you elaborating on that. And let me know if this is correct. But it sounds like deadlifts aren't inherently injurious from your perspective. It's when there's this excessive load mismanagement of doing too much too soon, doing too much of 
loads that people aren't prepared for, potentially in positions that they haven't adapted to, that's when it's concerning and that's when you tend to pull back. But in these other populations, you're promoting resistance training, you're promoting individuals that need to do this in their daily life. Is that fair to say, Stu? 100% correct. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't do a good job on 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 that uh, uh, answer. But having said that now, um, may I show the process of what goes on with uh, heavy resistance training and how it can be good or bad based on where the tipping point is and the adaptation processes. I, I think this would be really uh, educational and it would give us a hell of a data set to uh, discuss. Sure. May, may yeah, I of uh, go to that? Mm -hmm. So I prepared a little bit of a slideshow. So um, I'm, let me go to, where was it? Share. Mark coached me through this once. Presentation. Uh, no, upload the presentation. Not now. Darn. Uh, for share people, screen. Share screen. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> for people listening, this is available on YouTube to watch as well. So you can follow along not only with what Stu is saying, but what he's going to be showing. Okay, I cannot see you uh, at this point, but just let me uh, go through these slides. Can you see the full screen? Yes, yes. you can, yes. Stu. Okay. Oh, just uh, something. Uh, m my daughter listened to your podcast. In fact, it was she who told me about it in the first place. I'm I'm not great on uh, spending time on social media. And I believe it was Mark who was concerned when I said, I don't care about the background of course delegates that, that take our courses. Um, and, and this is, very, it was a very good point you made. Um, I am absolutely not promoting this idea that people take our courses and they can go out and, and help back paying people. Uh, in order to become qualified as a master clinician, the people must have a clinical qualification such as physical therapy and MD, DC, DO, et cetera. And then those who qualify as a certified, they also have to be members of a body that has a disciplinary process, um, uh, et cetera. They, they carry practice insurance as a clinician, et cetera. So I thought that was important just to point out. We, we are, they have to pass our exams, which are written and uh, practical to demonstrate their uh, 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 competency, shall we say. Oh, and, and one more thing that I, I thought I would clarify before we get on to the adaptation bit. Uh, you mentioned Professor uh, John Gregorio. Uh, Laura John Gregorio. Uh, she is uh, an outstanding professor at my old university. Uh, you, you may find this entertaining. She was my undergraduate student and I was the department chair at the time when we hired her. So I know all about Laura. And in fact, when you look at the authorship of the document from Osteoporosis Canada on prescribing exercise, uh, the credits go to Dr. John Gregorio and this fellow, Stuart McGill. And the next paper I, that was based on was my name as well. So just to be clear, I'm very familiar with the exercises and uh, load management to stimulate osteogenesis uh, in these people. Um, uh, so I, I hope that clears up uh, that as well. But let me talk about the potential for uh, disc adaptation. and. Uh, you, you can choose. If you want me just to get through this, uh, that might be best. If we look at the cellular level, I was putting together uh, all sorts of studies, um, but then I really found this review that I thought was fair. Mechanobiology of the Human Intervertebral Disc by Rufili and colleagues, and it came out uh, last year. The important lessons of looking at least at the cellular level of disc adaptation is if you have a undamaged virgin disc, shall we say, uh, there is an anabolic response in the nucleus, the cells inside the nucleus, and uh, under traction in the uh, annulus, and the annulus goes into traction when you apply load. But the loads 
uh, sorry, the loads, um, when they exceed greater than gravitational influences, they produce a catabolic response. The second thing that we can learn from their review of the literature is these adaptations appear only to occur in non-degenerated uh, spines, um, not really in a one that's on the degenerative cascade, shall we say. So that's an important starting point. So now let's discuss, and I think people did take umbrage, and I, I didn't word this well. If you are trying to adapt extreme mobility, it does compromise extreme load bearing, but that's not where the general population wants to be. They want a little bit of uh, mobility and a little bit of uh, load resilience, and I get that. So let me uh, frame that up a, a little bit better. I couldn't care less if a person wants to touch their toes, do deadlifts, or if they don't have pain, but people only see me because I'm a pain specialist. So if there's pain, if I then perform a pain provocation test, just a simple test like this, they sit and slouch and that replicates their back pain. And in fact, it replicates or triggers a radiating symptom in their little uh, left toe. Now I am concerned about that. So it's all within the context of pain. So now let me go on to not cellular adaptation, but moving up a level to tissue adaptation. So if we were to look at the ball and socket, and it's no coincidence that either side of the spine is a ball and socket joint, the hips and shoulders, which are made for developing power through a range of motion, I get that. But the disc is not a power generating structure. It's an adaptable fabric and it's a composite. In other words, it follows the rules of fabric science rather than a ball and socket joint. So the annulus contains a pressurized nucleus. That's what the nucleus looks like. There's type one collagen strands that give the disc strength and stiffness. Uh, type two gives it elastic behavior to allow it to move. And then collagen types three through 12 create cross links to hold all of the collagen fibers together because if they delaminate apart then the pressurized nucleus from within seeks the delaminations works their way through and that's the process of a disc bulge as i will prove in a minute so let's talk about adaptation for mobility as we see on the lower left or we can go over and look at dave tate on the right who uh, has to develop very high load bearing ability. There are people who will look at the collagen literature, the adaptation literature, and say, yeah, yeah, tendons, collagenous tissues adapt. And there's no question they do. If you look at Professor Jill Cook's uh, very good work on the Achilles adaptation, it's true. However, the distinction there is that the applied load and the stress and strain is parallel to the collagen fibers in the Achilles tendon. Such is not the case with the disc, where concentric layer upon concentric layer, the fibers run in opposing directions. So if you twist, one concentric ring is strained in tension, and the next concentric ring uh, is, is slack. So now you're creating stresses between the concentric layers. And uh, my colleagues at the University of Waterloo, Noguchi and Callahan, showed with micrographs how repeated motion with load uh, tends to delaminate these collagen fibers because of the differential stress strains layer upon layer. Very unlike a much more homogeneous uh, Achilles tendon. So the disc is different. So if we were to look at a twist, for example, one layer goes into uh, stress, tension strain, and the other uh, is approximated. When we dye the nucleus a chromium blue, and then we repeatedly twist uh, a disc over and over again, you can see how the leakage uh, of the nucleus works through the delaminated collagen. And if it's a twist motion, that 
goes around the concentric layers. And if we use microsurgery to peel off the concentric layers, in fact, you can see the delamination occurring of the disc. And it's exactly the same with flexion. Uh, if you add load sooner or later, uh, uh, up to a tipping point, uh, it will be fine, but sooner or later, it will become uh, excessive. And I don't know if I'm wording that correctly. There has to be an excessive uh, component, and that's different uh, for everybody that will lead to a focal disc bulge. So the idea of adapting collagen depends on the type X. Keeping the collagen type 1 and 2 together as a fabric to contain the nuclear uh, liquid gel. So uh, again, this is other people's work. Um, there's a decrease in the interlaminar matrix, the binding collagen with loaded flexion cycles. You can't get away from that. Uh, Tori's work, um, once the degenerative process has occurred, so we've instigated this delamination process, uh, the disc will not heal. You're only managing it on this degenerative cascade, shall we say. So whether you keep mobile for yoga or stiff for load bearing, um, if you want to be maximum at either one, you compromise the other. But most people, as I said, want to be in the middle. So let me work down that line of logic now. If a person has a virgin spine, no question, they can adapt a bit more mobility and a bit more load bearing. But once the initial cascade has begun, um, you're only managing it, is my opinion. And that's, this is now why I'm going to say this. And now we can go right to deadlifts. If we look at people uh, deadlifting, uh, and excessively, the first injury that usually occurs is not to the uh, disc per se, it's to the bone, the trabecular structure right underneath the end plate. So I did say in my Atia podcast, end plate health is very important, and let me show why. So this is a high-resolution CT micrograph, which most radiologists don't have the privilege of working with. And we loaded this specimen. This was uh, a pig spine because I couldn't find any human volunteers. And we loaded it to a level commensurate with about double body weight uh, deadlift. And you can see how the uh, bone matrix underneath the end plate fractures up a little bit and there's height loss. Now, very important distinction. Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? It's a good thing if you consider, how, if we learn a lesson from an elite power lifter who will get micro fractures, but they leave several days between heavy training sessions and the bone will form a callus. And the radiologist will say, oh, this poor person has sclerotic bone in their end plates. And I'll say, no, they're an adapted load-bearing athlete. That's what they did. But the next person uh, keeps training maybe one day off between exposures, and these micro-fractures accumulate. Well, um, when that micro-fracture occurs, it allows an ingrowth of blood vessels, which once again, it's like the old Chinese farmer's proverb. I don't know if you've ever heard that. It could be good. It could be bad. I will follow that idea of blood vessel growth and invagination of nerves being good or bad. But there's definitely more load on the facet joints. We've measured that as, as, ma as many others have as well. There's less nerve space. The uh, lateral foramen is compromised. There's a decreased nutrition flow across the end plate uh, of the disc. There's a radical change in the biomechanics and neutral zone behavior, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So, you know, this is recognized by my medical colleagues who are tracking the instigation of these degenerative changes long before they have pain. But my point is, uh, not their point, my point, uh, this could be a beneficial adaptation, but it's not really. It's a healing process. Uh, or they could be developing 
cumulative micro trauma, and it has entirely everything to do with the programming from the strength and conditioning specialist or the PT or whoever is doing that. So I've introduced this notion of things beginning in the end plate, but now let me tie that in to a disc bulge. So when I have athletes who are at the end of their careers, it's wonderful as a study cohort because they bring me their MRIs every single year that they were competing. So let me use this example. You can see in the left panel here, there is an implate fracture. There's edema, a modic change. The athlete has uh, sustained a fracture. The next year, they develop uh, a disc bulge as the collagen fibers lose their anchor on the end plate now. Well, most surgeons, once they do a discectomy and they suck out the, the bulge, so to speak, when they do analysis in the lab afterwards, and this is the laboratory analysis of this particular fragment, there were fragments of cartilaginous end plate, fibrous tissue, and cancellous bone. Now you're starting to see the link. Disc bulges most often start as end plate damage from excessive compression. So when I, this was in my mind in the Peter Atia con, uh, uh, podcast. Well, hold on, is McGill being uh, cavalier in all of this? Let's look at uh, Yajisa Karen's work. It was an Issel's prize winning study. He looked at the progressive disc bulge in subjects and concluded that 65% of them had evidence of cartilaginous end plate, broken end plate, carried through the open fissure in the collagen. Uh, in other words, more than half of the disc bulges started with end plate failure. Again, now you get why I said keep your end plates healthy. It's very important. and. I know there's discussion about this on the uh, internet, but it's it, there's no controversy. Once the end plate has been damaged, it's now essential that there be loaded flexion cycles to carry that material through the delaminated collagen. And uh, this is a dynamic disc designs model. It's about the most uh, biofidelic model. Um, as the uh, specimen is uh, flexed, you'll see hydraulically the effort pushing the nucleus through. But if they don't flex, you can now bear heavy compressive load. So again, the style of deadlifts and lifting and whatnot become very important if the person has this particular type of damage and cascade going on. So now movement form is very important. Well, you also mentioned the returning of a nucleus being a vacuum phenomenon, uh, and I think you took umbrage with that, but here's why I said that. This was one of our machines where we would flex spines under various loads and various flexion cycles to create disc bulges. So we would dye the nucleus uh, with barium, and we would watch it under x-ray with repeated flexion and load combinations. We would see the nucleus work its way through the delaminated collagen until you have a frank disc herniation, as I'm showing here. And then we would uh, try different procedures to see, can you literally vacuum in the disc bulge? And I think the study that you found was uh, my, my work with Joan Scannell, where yes, in other words, a McKenzie floppy push-up or repeated extension um, did show evidence that you could vacuum back the uh, nucleus through the open fissure into where the nucleus is supposed to be. And not only we showed that, but others have shown it as well. And I, I will say that uh, Santrizos, uh, they didn't use pigs, they used humans. So th this is a rather robust uh, observation. But here's the rub. What we found was if 65 to 70 percent of the original disc height was remaining, the vacuuming ability 
seemed to occur. But if the disk was flattened more than that, it didn't occur. So that, that was the caveat on, on that vacuuming in idea. Well, now let me segue to floppy push-ups. I'm not opposed to them for a week or two in an acute situation. For some people, if they have 65% of their disc height remaining or more, it can be a very acute symptom settling disc bulge vacuuming uh, procedure. Where I do get concerned is where some clinicians will say, oh, keep doing it for the next year. Because in our experience, we then see those people coming back with extension intolerance because now, uh, it was diminishing returns. The floppy push-ups did their job with the disc, but then they inflamed the facet joints. Let me follow that. So we tested that. Um, we said, what happens instead of doing a floppy push-up? Can we get the same vacuuming dynamics with just a static extension? So when I talked with Peter about simply laying and breathing, this is what I had uh, in mind. And uh, if you read my clinical textbook, Low Back Disorders, we tried to explain all this uh, there. So if the person lays, and by the way, these are animal spines because I couldn't actually take a disc out of this person. If they laid there uh, for 10 minutes, we saw the same vacuuming uh, occurring with the caveat that it only worked in discs that had 65% of their original height remaining or more. Well, you might say those are animal spines. Where's the human evidence? Well, last year, uh, Harrison's group uh, did a study on just holding your spine with your hands going into repeated extension versus just statically holding in that position. And there was much less height loss with just standing uh, extension. Now, I, uh, I'm gonna go one step further and say, let's lay them prone and take out the uh, hydrostatic stresses of gravity in a vertical position. But nonetheless, it's more evidence that these things occur in uh, uh, humans, which is a concern for some people, again, who misquote our work, oh, McGill only works on pig spines. Do you know less than 10% of our published papers were involving animals? There seems to be two phenotypes in this whole situation. Let me bring out two of them. So I've described one where I think the evidence is quite overwhelming that yes, if disc height remains, you can vacuum in a disc bulge if there's an open fissure. But there are some people whose disc bulges resolve without any special exercises. How can that possibly be? Well, Peng Fei's work uh, of uh, a couple of years ago um, created a, a very interesting hypothesis. We know that with a fresh disc herniation, it creates a very heavy inflammatory super response. Uh, the body treats the extruded nucleus as a foreign body. Uh, it was fused up before neurulation in the fetus. So it's never seen the immune environment and it's a creates a very heavy immune response. What Peng Fei uh, showed is that the macrophages from the inflammatory response invade the disc protrusion, uh, allowing an ingrowth of blood vessels, and it shrinks the disc bulge. Really interesting. However, the rider on that is that it only seems to occur if there isn't a modic change or the end plate damage. I'm going right back to the end plates. So if the end plate has been damaged, I think we're left with the vacuuming option as a clinician. But if it's not, um, specific exercise appears not to matter quite so much. This idea of there being two phenotypes was uh, also introduced by Mike Adams and, and Trish Dolan, fabulous uh, disc biomechanists. And in their opinion, and they have a wealth of uh, uh, observations of human discs for many, many years in, in all of their studies. 
Uh, the first phenotype starts again with end plate driven disc degeneration. It appears more in the upper lumbar spine than the lower thoracic spine. Um, the disc plate fractures. It seems to have a high heritability. In other words, it's, it's genetically modulated and it is associated with compressive injuries. And I've seen my share of them with excessive uh, weight training. So again, that, that, that's very much a, a concern of mine. The other phenotype is quite different, and it's an annulus-driven disc degeneration that involves a radial fissure, the fissure that I showed that we uh, see so often when we repeatedly flex the spine. Uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, genetically uh, predisposed, but it is a function of repeated bending and lifting. In other words, loaded flexion. We see this over and over and over again. And when I, I'm just giving, this is stolen right from uh, uh, Adams's uh, work, the end plate driven fracture that many of us are, are used to seeing being one type and the open fissure being the uh, second phenotype from uh, loaded flexion. So, you know, can you adapt a disc? I don't think you can once this injury process and degenerative cascade has occurred. I don't see the evidence for that. However, what I do see is that it can be managed. And I think we have sufficient proof. And I'll use the athlete stories in that many of us have rehabilitated athletes back to world record level and Olympic performance through careful management. We're not going to give them back a 16-year-old spine that they can adapt whichever way they choose. Well, that's all well and good, but is there any evidence that it's even possible to adapt a disc? So I'm going to finish up this line of logic with this last study. Some say posture doesn't matter, and I know it's a bit more complicated than that, but this was a meme on the internet, which I agree with, by the way. This is a normal spine, but this is called a lordotic spine, and their point was that's also a normal spine, which I agree with or at least I thought I agreed with, until we did this next study. So uh, I'm, I know you're familiar with the neutral zone. Many of the listeners may not be. But a joint at rest follows or falls into elastic equilibrium of zero stress. If you flex a joint, it goes into extension stress. And if you extend the joint, it goes into extension stress. And then there's bony stops that define the motion. So it's so interesting. What we're doing is increasing or decreasing the size of the neutral zone scientifically, and we're changing the steepness of the transition zones. That's what we're talking about when we're adapting for mobility or stability or load bearing. So this was a very critical question. And by the way, we published in this in 2003 in physical therapy. This was the most downloaded paper in the journal that year. But I, I think now people have forgotten it. What Joan did was she took 150 undergraduate students and she screened them for the level of lordosis in their spine, hypo and hyperlordosis. She took the six most uh, extremes. And then she measured the neutral zone. Well, this was fabulous. When you look at the hyperlordotic, the ones with a lot of curve in their low back, they stood outside of their elastic uh, uh, equilibrium. In other words, outside of their neutral zone, they stood in elastic stress, which is phenomenal. And yet the hypo or the flatbacks, they didn't stand in stress, but they sat in elastic stress. So again, there's no such thing as back pained people and non-specific to me. All of these things are critical determinants in determining what is going to be the most appropriate intervention to take a person's pain away that we know from the provocative tests is stress concentration driven. So what Joan then did was she took the six hyperlordotics and gave them exercises and did the opposite in the hyperlordotic, pardon me, based on Vladimir Yonda's work, which is, in a nutshell, you uh, strength train 
muscles that are perceived to be weak and you uh, stretch muscles that are perceived to be overly uh, uh, engaged or, or stiff. So, or I, he actually used the word weak. So you uh, stretch those that are, uh, strengthen what is weak uh, and, and uh, mobilize what is tight, to use his words. Well, here were the results of the study. Remember at the beginning of the trial, the hyperlordotic stood in elastic stress. Over the trial of those exercises, Joan proved that she changed their stress strain curve. I did not think this was possible. I was wrong. I had to change my opinion and go with the science. So physical therapists can adapt discs uh, in, in normal people, but they just have different standing levels of lordosis. What a fabulous finding. But you'll also see while, they, while she was able to reduce their standing stress, she actually increased their sitting stress. So you can't gain on, on both swings in the merry-go-round. There's always a compromise. There's, there's no free lunch in biology. And what happened more with the hypolordotics was she was ex able to expand the neutral zone and increase their range of motion that didn't cause stress to the tissues. So, you know, the lesson in all of that is uh, corrective exercise isn't straightforward. Um, uh, but there you go. There is a little bit of a forum. I'm going to stop sharing for now and uh, let's uh, uh, and show what do I need to do to get back to you now? We can see you. Your screen has stopped sharing. You might just need to click um, whatever your browser is that had oh, Riverside right. open. Uh, there you are. Okay, fabulous. Anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to create that line of logic to explain to people why I think the way I do. Yeah, Stu, we really appreciate you coming so prepared, obviously, by the presentations, uh, the, the slides that you've prepared. And I think both Chris and I and most people probably wouldn't disagree with you that repetitive loaded flexion cycles is a mechanism for an injury to the vertebral end plate, an injury to the disc. So if that was the interpretation that you gathered from us based on what we talked about, you know, I don't think we disagree on, on that in, in any case. I think on some points we probably will agree. Many of the listeners know they're, they're familiar with Scott Dye's envelope of function, where you're trying to find this optimal load of, um, you know, kind of improving your, your tolerance and capacity, not exceeding that and, and not underdoing that. And I know that you've been talking about that concept long before that. And you, I think you describe it as this tipping point. So I guess, you know, maybe so we can get on the same page here. Is your concern with maybe not even just the deadlifts, but certain resistance training exercises in general, is, is your concern more so just when they exceed that tipping point? And obviously that tipping point is going to vary between individuals and it's going to vary across time. Is that more of the concern as opposed to just the, the, the deadlift as an exercise? I was with you 100% till you, you brought up the, the last sentence. Um, yes, our job, it, look, everything in biology requires stress. It requires load. Psychologically, we, we require stress. Our hormonal system requires stress. Our bones, our joints, everything, our teeth all require stress. But every system has a tipping point. If the stress is below the tipping point, it's anabolic. It's wonderful. If it exceeds the tipping point, it's catabolic. Injuries accumulate, stress accumulates, and uh, not good things uh, happen. So our job with what we do is to understand the relationship of load, which ultimately gets down to tissue strain, and uh, manage it. And you manage it by magnitude, repetition, duration, appropriate rest. But if a person injures, 
the tipping point lowers. Now the balance point changes and the options that we have to stay under the uh, tipping point decrease. So I might choose, uh, I mean, if, you know, you, 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 I'm just going into just one little part of BackFit Pro. You see the belt squat machine over there? So instead of deadlifts, I will uh, take someone who needs the ability and the horsepower to extend their hips. They might be a downhill skier or a cyclist or whatever, but they have load compromise in their back right now. They've lowered the tipping point. So I will load them choosing a tool that they can keep the anabolic process going. So I'm all about precise understanding of their mechanism, honing in on where that tipping point is, and different regions of their body will require different considerations, but we're always modifying the program and the exercise. So um, you see, I just can't go to that last sentence and say deadlifts generically. It might be, no, I might have to take out deadlifts for a while. In fact, let, let, let me give you uh, an experimental uh, piece of evidence here that you, you might riff on or enjoy. I don't know. If you take a volleyball team, and we've done this twice, and the coach came to us and said, this had nothing to do with pain. It was just a, a, an undergrad was, was one of the uh, strength and conditioning coaches for the volleyball team. And the coach said, I want all my players to increase their vertical jump. So, okay, we did a squat training program. Now, wouldn't you think that putting the players on a resistant squat training program would increase their vertical jump? Well, it didn't. On average, it did a tiny bit. But I'm not interested in the average response. I'm interested in the variance. 50% of the players increased their vertical jump a couple of inches. 30% lost height from their vertical jump after a strength training resistance squat program. And about 20%, there was no difference. And I thought, well, that's odd. Let's do it again. So we did it again. Now, here's where the gold is. Was there something that distinguished the people who were negative responders versus those who were resp positive responders. And yes, there was. If you line up the volleyball players from tallest to shortest, you name them off, one, two, three, four, all the way up to 11 or 12, however many play players there are. And then you sit them down and you repeat the same thing and you'll see the order changed. And what that did, it, was, it showed us the ratio of their height to sitting height or leg length. Um, the uh, uh, second question that we asked, and, and it's funny, young players know this, are you naturally quick or are you naturally strong? So now we got into a neurological variable that separated out the groups. And it was so interesting, naturally quick, you go over here, naturally strong, you go over here. That was about the best predictor of whether they were a, a responder or a non-responder. So let me ask you now, who do you think the naturally quick or the naturally strong jumped higher with a squat jump resistance program? You're asking me, okay, so you had two groups, naturally quick, naturally strong. I would expect the group that maybe is exposed to what would seemingly be a newer stimulus to them, the naturally quick might respond to the resistance. You're exactly training. correct. So strength coaches don't want to hear this, or, or maybe they do. But it isn't always about making everyone stronger uh, with resistance training. If you're naturally quick and you add a bit more strength, perfect. You've balanced up the system and they jump higher. But muscle strength and force. When a muscle contracts, it creates force, but it also creates stiffness. Maximum force, you can't move. You've got to pulse it. So uh, adding more strength to strength actually slowed them down. <laughs> but the, but the, isn't that interesting that the variance, again, was much more important and insightful to me than the average response. So when we see studies, and we're going to get into nonspecific low back pain, I get it, and they show that no exercise matters, I just do exercise. I will argue that to the nines when we get into uh, subcategorizing groups. 
but uh, anyway, that's I know you wanted to talk about that. But anyway, I don't know if you want to riff on that anymore. But that's where I come from when I say those kinds of uh, statements. Yeah. And just going back to the presentation, I do have a couple other questions. And you can let us know if this is a misinterpretation, a misunderstanding, a misapplication of what you teach. But I think some physical therapists and maybe even some patients will develop the concern that patients become fear avoidant of lumbar flexion. An example, I saw somebody yesterday through a remote consultation who, and this, I want to be very clear, this was not like a, he wasn't seeing a McGill certified provider, but, you know, he was doing bird dogs and, and he was told to avoid bending his spine. And at the point that I saw him, it didn't seem like it was any long, maybe at some point, you know, minimizing that lumbar flexion for him was helpful, but he was at the point where it seemed to be contributing to his um, impairments and in, in function and, and, and symptoms. So do you think when people make that claim that potentially they become fear avoidant, is that a miss? application and misinterpretation of, of what you and I, I guess practitioners in general um, discuss? Yeah, I don't know where this comes from. I, I think it comes from people discussing who don't really understand uh, what it is we do. If we determine that flexion or loaded flexion is their pain trigger, we avoid it to wind down their symptoms, uh, sensitivity and whatnot. Do we have an, a chance to adapt their spine so eventually they can flex it? Um, I hope the previous presentation will show not so much as we have to manage it. Okay, now we're going to manage that. And it's a matter of coaching. And again, I know some people don't like me using anecdotes, but you know, I think of the, say you take a triathlete who uh, they have had a, a flexion intolerant causing disc bulge. They can't ride a bike. It, it's not possible. So we slowly avoid, uh, sorry, we, we wind them down with avoidance, and then we build them back up with exposing them to the bike. Now, I'm going to back off deadlifts for them because I think it will compromise their ability to get back onto the bike. Adding more compression from the deadlift um, and and resistance training, I might have to use the belt squat as I, as I showed over there uh, to get there. But then we use typically a three day rolling cycle. So we'll take that particular triathlete and say, "Go ride a bike for five minutes first day. Let's see if you're robust enough to do it." Day two, audit your body. Don't ride a bike. That's the adaptation day, and that's the trick of it all. If you get a green light, day three, ride the same exposure, but add 10%. Day four, audit. If you get the green light, don't train anymore. That's the adaptation day, etc. So it's a three-day rolling cycle. Sometimes we'll use a longer rolling cycle. Um, and then let's say that person found their limit. Uh, okay, you found your limit, but it was only a 10 minute more exposure. They don't blow up the previous three months of rehab. They just have a little bit of a tweak. And, you know, we all accept that. that that's fine. And then we repeat the procedure. They wind it down a lot faster because it's only a very minor tweak. And we get right back onto the uh, re-exposure. So I don't think anyone can criticize our success with, you know, people who need flexion. Think of a jujitsu player. They need loaded flexion. I've got athletes in, 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 in the UFC who we have to really limit the amount of time they train jujitsu on the mats to allow them to have the capacity left to get into the octagon. Okay, that's what we do with them. And uh, I mean, that's the reality. We, they're not going to be 16 again, and, and we can only work with what we have. So... I think your question also was, was fear avoidance. And that to me, it just came from bad coaching. Oh, don't ever flex your spine. I don't think we say that. I think we say very strategically, here are some movement hacks 
So when you tie your shoe, put your foot up on the bench, move your hips in, and it gets us a faster wind down of the symptoms. That's what we're all about. So I, I hope that clears up that. And I, I hate to say it, but I think there are some people who really misrepresent our material for their own perception, perhaps. Um, anyway, I'm glad you gave me that opportunity. Uh, you know, again, here's an anecdote that you might not like, but I'll say it anyway. Let's say we have a, a soldier who really wants to be a commando in the British uh, Special Forces or a Green Beret. You must pass the speed sit-up test as part of your, if you can't pass that, you're, you, you can't get in. So how do we get someone who's had quite a massive disc bulge back to pass the test? We don't train the test. And now we can have a discussion on transference. Um, there's actually studies that show you can get better at doing speed sit-ups by not training them. We will do planks, walkouts, rollouts, all kinds of heavy uh, abdominal work. And then they actually exceed their ability uh, otherwise to do the uh, speed sit-up test. So, you know, people are people. We, we, we try and as best we can come up with the best strategy for success for them. But it's all about empower them, empowering them with good coaching, giving them hope. And uh, I, I'm, I'm like you. My heart just sinks when I hear people say, "Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so afraid of moving my spine." Or uh, yeah. Anyway, that, does does that help a little bit? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, to go ahead, Mark. I'll say I, I think we're also in agreement there. You know, in agreement with activity modifications, load management, graded activity, graded exposure, empowerment. That's part of our, the, one of the E's in, in E3 is empowerment. Um, what are the other two? I'm curious. Empowerment through evidence-based education, which some people oh, have. Nice. Uh, some people okay. say, oh, it should be evidence-informed rather than evidence-based. And, you know, it's uh, semantics. Of course, I'm, I'm not going to argue that <laughs> nuance, but good for you. You know, this is the thing. I've, I've talked to so many people and we'll go and have lunch or something. And you, I can just feel them bristling at the beginning of lunch. And then I'll say, OK, well, let us see where our differences are. By the end of lunch and we, we've had a beer, there really aren't any. Somehow through nuance or or me saying a sentence <laughs> in a long thing it's triggered up this this storm and i uh, there aren't too many people where i would really disagree with and if we disagree so no oh, good <laughs> i want to highlight something else you said Stu, and agree with you on a lot of the statements you just made with what it sounds like is a very reasonable graded exposure process back to what someone needs or wants to get back to, whether it's their sport or their life. And you're having these check-in periods of, as we introduce this new dose or this timeline of activity, are they able to tolerate? And like you said, if there is a small flare up and it's manageable and it resolves, we're not going to freak out. We're going to continue slowly exposing them over time. So I really appreciate you mentioning that. And to the point of if someone is symptomatic with something like deadlifts and their sport is not deadlifting and they're a skier, how can we maintain and continue to build upon those other fitness levels through something like a belt squat to continue to move them forward for their sport and training? And I think Mark and I would both agree with modifying the things that are uncomfortable and provocative, but not letting these qualities, these fitness qualities continue to detrain and just remove all of the stimulus. So I really appreciate you, you mentioning that as well. Stu, I have another follow-up question, and this is once again, per perhaps a misunderstanding, misinterpretation, but you know this literature better than anyone because you've studied it regarding the difficulty with reducing or avoiding, I, I, sh I should say avoiding lumbar flexion with different resistance-based exercises, whether it's kettlebell swings, the deadlifts, the squats, the um, atlas stone. You know, some people might argue, well, it's impossible to avoid lumbar flexion 
with daily activity. So is the concern if somebody is symptomatic, it's let's minimize that lumbar flexion. Let's minimize the, the loaded lumbar flexion as opposed to we're avoiding it completely because in, in reality, it's, you know, it'd be impossible to completely avoid lumbar flexion. Is that question coming across? Like, does that make sense? Uh, I'm, I'm struggling to pull out exactly what it is you want me to respond to. I think, you know, people sometimes, you know, hear the message that we can completely avoid lumbar flexion and that it, and at certain times we should avoid lumbar flexion. And is that kind of this, is that an extreme? And instead of saying we're avoiding lumbar flexion, it's we're decreasing a certain amount of lumbar flexion during these periods of flare ups. Okay, I, or... I think I get, I think I get it. You're talking about degrees and all I can say is, well, degrees matter. Uh, for some, they will need to sit with a lumbar support in order for them to get up and play major league baseball. And if they sit sitting on a floppy couch or on the team bus uh, without a lumbar support, they will have problems playing the game. So in that particular case, the more disciplined they are, the more game playing capacity they will have. Is it forever? I hope not. Um, the next person, there's a bigger margin of safety. So, I mean, I don't know what, what more I can say about that in, in, in that your job is to determine what that margin of safety is. Um, you, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of do you think a, an Olympic rower flexes their spine? You know, I've, I've taken uh, several Olympic national team members uh, and master's level gold medalists, world, world gold medalists, who couldn't tie their shoe. So we avoided flexion, but we got them back to meddling in that sport. We didn't do it by avoiding flexion, but we did in the beginning. So I, I, again, I, 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 these are anecdotes, I know, uh, but that's all we can do when we're dealing with real people and the diversity of their spine thickness, their lever ratios, their training regimens, their injury history, their gender, their culture, their psychology, their uh, physiology. Some just heal faster. <laughs> the amount of, shall I say, supplements <laughs> matters as well. All of these things. Gosh, you know, one of these days I'm going to be really wise. And, and this is what I say to the young people here. We're all, I hope, striving for mastery. If I can make it, and I keep seeing patients, I keep getting better with every patient that I see. And by the time I'm 90, I might be a pretty good clinician. I will finally have achieved a little bit of mastery. Anyway, I'm, I'm saying that as to, to encourage people. This is a journey. and. Uh, I just hope we all get it better. I've got some statistics that I've prepared for you that, that you might find interesting on uh, our clinical success. Uh, I, I know you, you uh, talked about uh, my ignoring epidemiology. I certainly don't ignore it. No, that was only when Peter said, uh, let's talk about the prevalence of acute low back pain. And I said, whoa, wait a second. I can't define acute disabling low back pain because if I have it, I'm a professor, I can do my job. If you're a plumber or a, a, a construction worker, you can't. So do you see, it's only disabling in the context of the person. And that's what I said. I did not say I don't pay attention to the uh, epidemiology and the clustering of very specific spine injury pathways around specific sports, occupations, uh, around cultures. Um, etc. So I, I think that might have been a, a, a bit of a misinterpretation. And I don't know if you want to go there, but uh... with with that being said, Stu, would you be open to doing a part two? I know Chris kind of has a, a hard cutoff today, and I felt like we covered 
a lot and we certainly appreciate your time and respect you coming on the podcast like at a future date would you because I, I know you I, have I, other slides and I, I i did say to you um after i uh, the atia podcast came out I, I don't know if you know i i took a month off with my wife and we just drove to the southern u.s with my dog and uh i i get hundreds of emails a day and podcast requests i i can't do it so that's why i you know i honestly said to you i i will speak to you on the phone while i'm driving i'll try and help you as much as i can my my problem is i mean i retired eight years ago now is it I, I want to go ride my bike or go for a ski. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come on your podcast again. And, and I, I'm, I'm enjoying you. Uh, it, it's lovely to talk about all of these kinds of things. Um, I, I have, my, my wife keeps reminding me, just say no so we can go for a ski. <laughs> well, we appreciate that because Chris was pretty up front in his email to you saying that, hey, we have some difference of opinions and different interpretations and you are willing to come on our podcast. And for people listening, this is being recorded three days after we just released our recent episode. So Stu was very, you know, willing to, to come on and prepare those slides as well. So that's, you know, thank you for doing that. We appreciate that. Well, I, I, I must say now, I didn't prepare those slides okay. for you. These are in the lectures that I give. Understandable. So, um, so they're they're all there. I mean, I I do these lectures for conference. I'm I'm speaking at a conference on Sunday, and guess what the topic is? Can you adapt a disc? <laughs> so you know, I the, 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 these are in my slide decks, and I have to pre, pre, pre create lines of logic for some pretty heavy crowds. I mean, these are physicians and and biomechanics people, and well, I can't pull wool over their eyes. These are highly educated, critical people. They hold my feet to the fire. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to creating these, uh, but I don't always get the opportunity. Could you imagine if I talked about that on, on the Atia podcast or any of the other podcasts? Uh, I mean, I thought the audience would be, if I know Peter Atia's audience, it, it is more, more thoughtful, more educated uh, uh, listeners uh, and, and uh, consumers. But man, I've had a lot of feedback from physicians who who listen to that uh, podcast. And uh, but anyway, I, I think it is more of an up there kind of a a, a podcast. Um, and I might have misjudged that uh, a little bit as well. But a lot of the podcasts, I I can't talk about the heavy uh, mechanical stimulation principles that we've been talking about here. Stu, maybe just to wrap it up and pull together some of the points that you discussed today i'm going to summarize it and if i miss anything or if you want to add it let me know but number one you're not inherently opposed to deadlifts uh, with really any age group it's dependent on how they're presenting to you maybe they've just done too much too soon They've had this huge spike in activity of the deadlift and they're very sensitized and you're pulling it back, like you said, for some amount of time. The deadlift itself is not inherently injurious. People can adapt to positions, but even if structurally they don't adapt, it's more this management principle. How do we move forward from the structure that they have and how do we gradually explode expose them back to the things that they need to do or that they want to do is that fair to say yes okay yeah well done okay yeah to me an exercise is simply a tool to reach a goal i don't uh, so i don't love or hate any tools i'm a tool hound by the way if you ever came out to my shop and i i hope i am in my professional life as well i just trying to pick the best tool for that particular individual, for their particular goal. And then I take into consideration their variables, be it their injury history or comorbidity or whatever it happens to be. So anyway, uh, I'm glad you, uh, I mean, I must admit, I, I, I don't wanna be criticized, but you, you did what you did. And uh, uh, so uh, I thought it was time to, uh, 
uh, have a discussion. Yeah. And, well, we appreciate uh, it. As too. I and said, a couple of, as I said a couple of times, once we have a discussion, um, I find there's very little agreement with most people, uh, not all. <laughs> very little disagreement. Is that what you meant? Yeah. yeah. Is that what I said? You said very little oh, agreement. Very, oh, because I'm an old man. Sorry. Very little disagreement. <laughs> yeah. And like we mentioned in the previous episode, our goal wasn't to attack you or Peter as a person. You all seem amazing and, and we don't know you as humans. It's more, let's just look at what was said and how do we dive into that? And the fact that you were able to come on and elaborate. And I think there's a lot of more agreement on a lot of these things than we probably would have assumed is amazing. And yeah, we really appreciate you for, for openness to this conversation. Well, my, my pleasure. And uh, I enjoyed both of you today. So uh, thanks. And if you get to uh, middle of Ontario, Canada, uh, let me know and we'll have a beer. I'll Sounds hold you great. to it. <laughs> we'll call it there, Stu. Thanks again. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye, gentlemen.